Okay, inductive and deductive reasoning. Um, so first off, I'm going to define a conjecture. That's an unproven statement based on observations. Okay, I've got an example um, conjecture here. An example conjecture, I think it's going to rain today. Okay, now I might, um, that could be a very educated guess, um, but I don't know for sure that it's going to rain. Um, so it's unproven and it's based on my previous observations. When it's cloudy out or there's dark rain clouds, then I might think it's going to rain. Okay. Um, all right. So for this next example, it says find a counterexample for the following conjecture. The sum of two numbers is always greater than either number. Okay. So I, this conjecture, it, it's, it sounds kind of good. The sum of two numbers is greater than either number, like 3 plus 4 equals 7, right? So 7 is greater than 3 and 4. Um, so what I want to try to do is find a counterexample to show that this isn't always true. So um, if, I use, um, if I use two positive numbers, it's always going to be true. But if, if uh, one of the numbers is either 0 or negative, it's not going to work. Okay, so my counterexample here, I'm just going to use CE for counterexample, is um, I can show that negative 3 plus 2 equals negative 1. Okay, and my sum is not greater than both of the numbers, right? It's, it's, not great, it's greater than negative 3, but it's not greater than 2. Okay, and there's an infinite amount of different counterexamples out there. Any counterexample that involves um, a negative number or a or a zero will work. Okay. All right, so inductive reasoning next. Um, this is making um, a guess based on um, patterns and observations. Self tends to space there. Okay, there are two basic kinds of um, reasoning, um, branches of reasoning. Um, there's inductive reasoning and then there's deductive reasoning, which we're going to get to in a minute. Okay, so we're going to spend most of our time in, in this chapter and, and in geometry using deductive reasoning, but we do use inductive reasoning all the time. And there's nothing wrong with inductive reasoning, it's just a uh, um, it's just not a surefire thing like deductive reasoning is. Okay, so we're making guesses. So looking, it says find the next two terms of the following sequence. So 3, 5, 7, well, it looks like it's odd counting numbers, right? So odd integers. So 3, 5, 7, I would guess that 9 and 11 would come next. I think most people would guess that, okay? Um, that's a really good guess because we have a lot of experience with this kind of a pattern because we're just adding two, right, to get from term to term. But I don't know for sure if those are the next two terms. It's just a really good guess, okay? Because I don't, maybe there's some other pattern. I don't, I can't see the rest of it. And it doesn't give me a rule. It doesn't say add two every time. It just tells me what the first three terms are. So I'm guessing based on those, okay? So that's an example of inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is, um, when we're going to use facts, definitions, or laws to prove something. Using facts, definitions, or laws. Okay. So this is, you can think of this as logic. This is logical. We're going logically from one step to another. So I'm going to put that in brackets here. Okay. So if you had to associate both of these with just one word, I would say um, inductive reasoning, patterns, deductive reasoning, logic. Okay. All right. And then under um, deductive reasoning, there are, are uh, two basic laws that we're going to cover. Um, the first one is called the law of detachment. Okay, 
So the law of detachment says that um, I'm going to use symbolic form here. If P to Q is true, okay, now let me talk about that for a second. That's um, a conditional, right? So P is the hypothesis, Q is the conclusion. So if if I've got a conditional that is true, an if-then statement that is true, and the hypothesis is true, then the conclusion, which I'm going to call Q, is true. Okay, now that's pretty weird when we, we look at it in that form, but it'll be more clear in uh, these examples. Okay, so here's an example. It says draw a conclusion using the law of detachment. So here we've got a conditional, right? We've got an if-then statement. If it's Friday, then we have a quiz. And then it says it's Friday. So this is my hypothesis. Okay, so my conclusion could be, oh, it's Friday. We have a quiz because I know it being Friday always leads to us having a quiz, assuming that this is true, right? Um, so my conclusion would be we have a quiz. I should have changed that to Monday for this year, but that was from last year. Okay. All right. Um, so um, next one, draw a conclusion using the law of detachment again. If it rains, then Bilbo wears a jacket. Okay, so this is my hypothesis. This is my conclusion. And then it says Bilbo wears a jacket. A lot of people are going to say, oh, well, then it rained or it, it rains or something like that. Okay, but that is, um, that is um, incorrect. It's misusing the law of detachment because Bilbo wearing a jacket is not the hypothesis. It's the conclusion of the original statement, okay? So you actually can't use the law of detachment here because it doesn't work with the setup. We need the, the, the hypothesis to be true in the second statement, not the conclusion, okay? So um, just thinking about this, you know, yeah, if it rains, then Bilbo wears a jacket, but maybe Bilbo wears a jacket other times. Maybe he wears one when he's cold, or maybe he wears one just to look cool or whatever, right? So there are other reasons he could wear a jacket. So I'm gonna say not possible just because it doesn't fit the criteria of the law of detachment, okay? You could guess it's because it rained, but we wouldn't know that for sure. That conclusion doesn't necessarily lead back to that hypothesis, okay? All right, so that brings us to the second law, which is called the law of syllogism. All right, and um, I'm going to use symbolic form again here. So if we've got a true conditional like that, and we've got another true conditional, this one's going to go from Q to R. Okay, and the key here is that those two pieces match up, okay? So, um, so it, it's going to be easier to explain this with an example here, okay? So let's draw a, a conclusion using the law of, oh, this should say the law of syllogism. Actually, all of these should say that. I'll fix that in the note-taking guide. Okay, so um, if it's sunny, then Sam will garden. Okay, so if it's sunny, then Sam will garden. So that is my P, my Q, hypothesis and conclusion. And now in the second sentence, these match up, right? So that's why I'm reusing that Q. If Sam gardens, then he will be happy. He will be happy would be the R part, okay? 
So in other words, you can kind of cut out the middleman. If I know it's sunny, then Sam's gonna garden, but if Sam gardens, then he will be happy. So I can say ultimately, if it's sunny, then Sam will be happy, right? Because I know in the end that's gonna happen. You can, you, you know, uh, it's gonna start with this and end with this. Okay, so our conclusion is gonna be if it's sunny, then Sam will garden. All right, another example here. Um, if Frodo gets sick, then he'll take a nap. Okay. Frodo gets sick, then he'll take a nap. If Frodo eats peanuts, then he'll get sick. Okay, so this one's a little strange. It'll throw people off sometimes um, because the order is mixed up. So some people might look at those parts in the middle and say, oh, those don't match up. Like they, like they should for the law of syllogism. So that means I can't use the law of syllogism. But I actually still do have matching parts. Frodo gets sick. Hill gets sick. Those are the same thing, right? So if we, if we talk about this in symbolic form, that first um, sentence, if we call this one P to Q, the second sentence... Well, the matching part was the was the Frodo getting sick, so that goes at the end of the second conditional. Okay. Now I don't have a name for the Frodo eating peanuts. It doesn't start with anything, so it's written like that. Okay. Now that's not in the right format yet, but you could rearrange this, right? So if this were written in um, in a different order, if I put these two sentences in a different order, then I'd be in good shape, right? So if I changed it so we put the first sentence first and then the second sentence, then we could use the law of syllogism. So now I can see, oh, okay, well, the R is going to lead to the Q. Okay, Then I have to figure out what the R and the Q are. Well, just think of it as a story. What would happen first in the story? Okay, well, I, um, Frodo eating... Eat, eats peanuts happens before him getting sick, and him getting sick happens before he takes a nap. So the beginning of the story is the Frodo eating peanuts. So I can say if Frodo eats peanuts, eventually he'll take a nap. Okay, so if it feels like it's not working on these ones, try to imagine if the um, sentences were in reverse order, and sometimes that'll make, and you could even rewrite it in reverse order if that's helpful, um, and and then you'll be able to, to see what you're looking for more easily. Okay. All right, last one. Let's draw a conclusion using the law of syllogism. If, if uh, Smeagol... Um, if Smeagol catches a fish, then he will eat a second breakfast. If Smeagol catches a fish, then he will return home. Okay, so let's say that Smeagol catches a fish is the original hypothesis. I'll call that P. Well, that happens again right here. Okay, so when I look at these two, I've got my um, hypothesis here leading to this conclusion, the second breakfast conclusion. And then I've got my hypothesis leading to this conclusion. And that's a different conclusion, okay? So I do have the matching pieces, but they're both, um, each one of them is a hypothesis, okay? And that means it's not going to work. So I'm gonna zoom out for a second because I wanna look at those last two examples. You need um, the matching pieces to one of them to be a hypothesis and one to be a conclusion, okay? So that happened in this first example, right? That my, my highlighted parts there are one's a hypothesis and one's a conclusion. That happened on the second example here. But it does not happen here because in this one, Smeagol catching a fish is the hypothesis of both of those. So that means that this example 
is not going to work with the law of syllogism. Okay, you could try to write a conclusion, but it's not going to be using the law of syllogism. Okay, so that's not how it works. And that is it for this section.